what are the roles and ratios of confidence to vulnerability in the record? Because it's both are there. It's confidence and vulnerability. And what do you think the ratio or the roles of them are? I'd split it right down the middle. Yeah. The confidence, I think, is definitely there in the music. Like the music is, you know, knows what it's doing. It's very, yeah. very, very confident. And uh, is there a new vulnerability in that record? Do you think? Well, I think in the way it was recorded, there's a little bit too, just yeah. in that you had yeah. with Albini, you yeah. don't have a lot of time to go, I'll do that again and yeah. again and again. It's... You know, the first track, um, Big Window, yeah. was the, let's do the easy one first. And we were stuck. We were stuck doing it again and again. And then Steve said, hey, come up to the control room. And and he just pulled us up stairs and said, hey, you guys are getting used to the headsets. Mm -hmm. This is all kind of new and weird. It's all there. You got this. Yeah. And went down. Okay. And, and then the next take? Knocked it out. Nice. It yeah. was just a weird little brain space we all needed to just clear out of and go do it. And then we got the rest of the basic tracks done. Yeah. It was really weird. It was like cool. big, big Brother going, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Big Brother Steve. Yeah. yeah. Could have been fingering the cord wrong. I don't know. Hi. So fucking high. So what? I'm high. I had been to Electrical Audio before. Years ago, Todd Trainer gave myself and the band I was with a tour of the studio. And I always thought it would be really great to record there because it's an amazing place. So I knew what it was like there, but I didn't, I didn't know what it would be like to work with Steve. A friend of mine described playing to a metronome as like driving with a cop behind you. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So it was even better than whatever it was I was thinking would happen because he was just so great, worked super hard, and was really generous with us. I have a, I'm, I just have like a natural reluctance to like tamper with, to like tamper with like just the way a band plays together and like putting like a sort of a mechanical governor on it. Just seems yeah. Like, intuitively it just seems uncomfortable, seems nasty to me. And the other thing is that just as my, as a listener, like I've literally never thought to myself, Oh, I would have liked that if it hadn't sped up a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like that that thought has just never crossed my mind. Yeah. So Okay, so I'll I'll cut you in and then we're gonna do some of that. I like that, yeah. That rim shot is yeah, I think that's it, fun. So I'll just kind of play with timekeeping through that intro. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. I think he's really good at giving a session what it needs, you know, like the fact that he could like kind of bust our balls, it made it a little more fun and less less serious and even though we were all dead serious and wanting, wanting to do a good job, but um, yeah, he had, a, he had a good way of kind of getting rid of some of that unnecessary pressure. What do you figure? I'm okay with it. I'm also okay. I'm good. All right. That's what we're shooting for. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the record was okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> band called They Dead on the side projects. I heard heard of him before. We played with They Dead two times. And so I remember being like at the front of the stage like we're see this guy. 
and it was unbelievable. To watch him play, I was like, Jesus Christ. You know, he was a force. The band was great, but it's like, if the band didn't show up and he just showed up and set up his drums and just played, that would have been a great show. It was, he was that good. It's like, I've run sound for so many bands, I've seen so many, so many great drummers, but like, this was like nothing like I've ever seen before. It's like, one guy was pretty close, he was that good. So then at some point we're like looking for a drummer. Like, we really need a drummer. Like, one, let's start at the top and then we'll work our way down. So like, let's make a, this is hypothetically, we didn't actually make a list, but they are like going, let's ask the best guy in the world. And then after he says no, then we'll ask somebody else. Cause you know, he's gonna say no. I think we were smart enough to not just ask him to be in our band. So like, that would never happen. We're just two guys he doesn't know from lacrosse. So we said, hey, Ian Prince, you don't really know us at all, but would you want to record six songs? We want to do an EP, just record it. And he said yes. Ian, so you want to be included? Yeah. Typically, the best thing to do is to start with the drums at 12 o'clock. Not only do we like the songs structurally and melodically, are they interesting, but where can we just let this guy shine? Because he's so dynamic and inventive. After you've been playing with so many guys for so long, it's like to have three guys who just didn't have any problems at all was like a small miracle. Anybody who's been in a band would like know like, if you can write six songs and nobody argues, it's a miracle. And so then to record those songs, and that also went really well. And, um, and then it was like, when it goes that well, it's like, well, let's play some shows. And then his band broke up, and then the other band that he was in fell apart too. So suddenly he like had a free schedule. So all of a sudden we just became a band and it was like, this is unbelievable. Does that answer the question? So the timing of it was really perfect, it, you know. It never was the intention to uh, join the band, but it just sort of happened that way. And I'm thankful it did, you know. I love those guys, and um, it was, it's been a lot of fun. We actually recorded the whole album in our practice space as if we were recording which is kind of fun. This batch of songs, like with Albini, the matchup was good. Knowing that we had so much to do in such a short amount of time, 
it was, it was sort of a lot of pressure. Everything was so quick, you didn't think too much about it. You weren't gonna sit there and dick around with like, oh, I think I can do better. It's like, you actually made it through the take without screwing up, that was the take. Which was phew, scary shit, man. Yeah. Scary. Probably great. Yeah, that was. We're gonna fade that out? We're gonna have yeah, a right. fader? Almost, it could be almost either all the way faded out or. It'd be my first fade song. <laughs> Sounded good, Ian. Good, yeah. That I beat that rocks. Pretty, I thought it was pretty solid. Yeah. I got one muff, but it's it would be easy to. to uh, can it. we go upstairs and listen? Hey, yep. Steve. We, um, we're pretty happy with that. Dave might want to fix a bass thing, but... Yeah, is yeah. that cool? All right. <laughs> yeah, the, the last verse, I thought it was, um... You... I thought it was a full verse, and I was yeah. wrong. So I, I didn't go to the... It will be quite apparent where I fucked you up. You fucked up, David. You fucked up. You gotta fix it, David. Fix it up. He's gonna punch two or three punches in the ring. You know how many I got? Yeah, I know. One. Fucking bullshit. Become so difficult at taking both the smiles. A lie. Awake. Is everything good? Should I assume the worst? I stay. Pin to the floor as I watch you float. Yeah, or we can start, yeah, you can start at the second verse, Steve. I'm not afraid. <laughs> Do you come across as a character uh, in your songs? Insofar as there's lyrics like, my days are done, I'll say no more. So there's this sense of the character always claiming that they're fading away, but then the music demands to be heard. I find that a really interesting dichotomy. Yeah. Um, Charming dichotomy. Well, that was a tough time mm. because I was right in the beginnings of a, of a divorce. Yeah. So the timing was horrible. That's basically what that record's about. Did you, did you have the that lyrics whole... already bef before? No. no. And so you almost had no choice as to what to write about exactly. because that was your life. That was the That's content. That's what was thing. happening. That's two? Sure. Okay. Yeah. This is I was good. talking about when the drums come in. Yeah. So, two from there. Two. Two. You guys are freaking me out, man. This is freaking me out. So the recording, it was good timing because it kind of gave me something to kind of jump into and let go of everything else outside of my own situation for a while and you know and it was a great experience so that made it even better jesus christ 
yeah, it's evil. Thanks, Steve. That's it for that guy. It was really, really nice. And, you know, the material on that record, you can, it's pretty obvious, like, kind of what my situation was. Um, out of the blue is probably the most <laughs> obvious. And then if we can um, sequester all this business away from your sitting position, because I have to, I'm going to have to uh, uh, give you some physical room here. Can you hear everything? Yeah. Cool. Good. Casey just kind of gets down to business. He might not say much, but yeah, he, he was really impressive. Like, I, I cannot believe how much he got done in such a short amount of time. And then the overdubs, Casey was a champ. Like he is, I mean, like, I would, I don't know how he, I was like, I would have folded under the pressure, but he was really just like, bombed through all of his vocals, just like basically all first takes. Feels like we're strangers again. I miss it so much. I was surrounded with really good people doing a really cool thing. Everybody was positive and excited for us. And so that really kind of, I have to say it just elevated me for a couple of days. It was really nice. Whatever happened to you, did I miss it? Of course, should I've noticed you right. It came out of the blue, my apologies sent to you in landing tonight. Shit, one more time. Fuck. I almost got it. Yeah. Letting my ears rest for a moment now because I've been playing that sort of continuously for about 15 minutes and I want to not hear it for a minute so that I can listen to it again. It's kind of like the background sound or like workplace noise, like you tune it out. So if you're listening to something over and over again, certain aspects of it start to lose their effect on you and you start tuning them out or your ear, you sort of defensively, your attention like turns away from them. And so then you're focusing on other things that may be fine, but because you're psychologically you've created this environment where you're not hearing things completely anymore you're just listening to little details then you end up mm -hmm. tweaking all those little details and then you end up in this weird spiral where everything just gets weirder and weirder and weirder okay. yeah. so. hedgehogs are fucking adorable though mm -hmm. so those ones that turn into little balls yeah, yeah. <laughs> little spiky bastards they are pretty mm -hmm. cute unbelievably cute and they have these little faces their little faces always look surprised and delighted <laughs> and they always have this like you know, kind of look on their face. Yeah, you should be playing along if you can. It was really a blast. And he was... To watch him do his thing is... <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing. And he was a fucking cool dude. He's really smart, funny, you know, knows his shit. And had some great stories and was open to talk about Anything we ask, like, why do you do this? So, it was really fun, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. For us, like, you know, Steve Albini has recorded our, our favorite bands and made our favorite records, and now you're in a room with the dude, and it's like, what's, what's gonna happen? We've gotta actually, like, come to bat. <laughs> so it was fun, it's exciting. Dave was really good at being jovial and, and fun and, and super enthusiastic about everything we ever did, you know, not just that experience, but... Um, yeah. 
I realized when the Albini record got over, I had been in the band for 10 years, and I was really tired. We were in Space Bike together from, it would have been 93, 94 to 98 or 99. Then I didn't see him for probably six, six or seven years. So I tricked him into Porcupine, kind of. It just, ha it was just good timing. He was ready to play, I think, and we needed a bass player. And so that worked out. And I mean, Dave's like a great bass player, really inventive. He's artistically, like always has great ideas for poster ideas. He's funny as hell. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're just best friends. So yeah, we've been doing this for a while. We rehearse with Ian, he lives in Minneapolis, so we drive up. And it, it ended up just being, it had nothing to do with personalities or any sort of strife in the band. Maybe not being in the band anymore had, had like started across my mind, it was basically just a matter of like, I boil it down to time and distance. It's like, I, the distance is too far and I don't have enough time. And I couldn't have, I had no way of basically fixing any part of that. I couldn't make, there was no way to make the distance shorter and there was no place to make any more time because I have a job and I have a family and you have obligations. Like there was nowhere to make any time. There was nowhere to make the distance shorter. So it's like the only way to make things right in my life was to maybe not do this anymore. And it was a super, super tough decision. And I, you know, one that I didn't necessarily wanted to do, but I did feel really tired. And it's like, and I felt like at some point it was like my brain just kind of went, and this is, this is no decision I made. It was just like, it's just one of these things that happens. It was like once 10 years hit and the record got done and the shows, the shows that you do for, to promote the record were kind of done. And then there was this space where we didn't have some shows. And it was like, my brain just went, Hey, you're done now. You need to maybe stop. And I was like, Oh fuck, I do. I probably do. <laughs> Cause it was like, I felt like I completed something. We just played with Babes and Toyland at at the High Noon Saloon and it was packed. It was a full house and the show was great. And, and, then, and then we were unloading our stuff from the warehouse um, rehearsal space. And he told me then that he had to quit the band. And I think he was concerned that I would be angry, but I was like, you know, I wasn't at all. I was glad he talked to me about it. I mean, I love him. I want him to be happy. It was not lost on me how kind of lucky we were to be doing what we were doing, you know. And that even just internally how well we get along and um, how much fun it is. Like I've, I've, you know, from pretty much from the beginning, I've really valued that. And when he told me he couldn't do it anymore and it was not going to be a thing, it was like a huge bummer. I think, you know, not at all in any way upset with him because I get it. I, I know it wasn't an easy decision for him. It was just sad. It was just a total bummer. Like, I remember getting off the phone with him and just kind of pacing around the house and, like, un almost involuntarily saying, fuck. I'd just be like, fuck. <laughs> I was like, ah, fuck. Uh, you know. I'd finished the record, I felt really good, and I was like, what if I could actually walk away from this and like be friends with these guys? That would be great, because I've never walked away from a band and been happy about it, because usually it ends, even if it ends good, there's still some sort of sour grapes. So it's like, going, you know, this has been the greatest experience of my life, Music musically. I'm like, going, if I could actually like, walk away from it and feel good about it. I mean, I'm never gonna feel good about it, but if I could actually like make peace with it and walk away, I'd be really, really, it'd be the, uh, the greatest gift. And so I tried to do it that way. 
and I hope that I can do it. I hope that I did it that way. It was fun. Good times. God, I love those guys. Shit. So, yeah, then you're like, what do I do? You know, I kind of just thought, well, we're done. And then part of me is like, well, I don't want to be done because I have more stuff I want to do. Do I want to start with a different band? No, because I worked my ass off with this one. <laughs> so, so the bass player mission started. So, so that's that. We're looking for a bass player. Hey, Steve, one more time. I can do better. I know it. So if there was sadness and anger, which are pretty good emotions, you know, for a songwriter in a way. To, <laughs> pretty, lots of good pretty songs typical. come from <laughs> that. We don't need to ask you, are you doing okay? It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah life is good. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Your singing voice is not quite the same as your speaking voice. Yeah, I know, because I yeah. can't sing. No, you can. <laughs> okay. It's your own kind of... I love, yes, hey, thank you. I love your band. I've listened to that record at least 20 times. <laughs> oh, well, and my co-workers fucking hate me. Like, so what are we listening to today? It's Fake Limbs. You like That's it? That's right. It's interesting. It's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. That's what my dad said. My so I gotta find some way to pay you before we leave. Yeah, probably. that's what I was calling your name for. Okay. Here's what I have. I'm not paying all that. Right, well.